Well, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a, it's a, pr a privilege and a pleasure to speak with you today about epilepsy. And uh, to do so, I thought I would first um, provide you a brief overview of what epilepsy is and what epilepsy is not, and then to discuss with you how epilepsy can be a disabling condition. And having discussed the ways in which epilepsy can be disabling, then to propose ways to overcome the challenges of disabling epilepsy. And to suggest to you that India is in a particularly unique position to lead the world in undoing the disabling aspects of epilepsy. There are a number of people I would like to thank, uh, and in particular the Srinivasan family for their support and encouragement uh, over these many years, and my friend and colleague, Professor E.S. Krishnamurthy, for the invitation to be here with you today, his father, Professor Krishnamurthy Srinivas, uh, who I too wish a happy and healthy 75th birthday. I'd also like to acknowledge the many caring physicians and allied health professionals that I've met uh, during my trip here, and also their spouses and family members who are the unsung heroes who allow their uh, husbands and wives to uh, pursue their passion uh, in their work and to spend many long hours each and every day caring for patients with epilepsy. The staff at the T.S. Srinivasan Center for Clinical Neurosciences at VHS Medical Center, who are an amazing and very dedicated group of healthcare professionals, and my colleagues uh, who, for these past couple of days, have worked diligently at the Conclave on Disabling Epilepsy uh, to uh, fashion a consensus statement about uh, the disabling aspects of epilepsy and the role that health policy and, in fact, government has in meeting these challenges. But first, but, but foremost and above all else, I want to acknowledge the inspiration that we in the healthcare profession derive from our patients with epilepsy and their families, uh, who uh, we have the privilege of seeing day in and day out. And yesterday we heard from two particularly remarkable people, Dharma, uh, a mother of a, of a uh, child with epilepsy, and Ignatius, a gentleman who has had epilepsy his whole life, but despite that is a very productive businessman. And to them I dedicate today's talk. I want to come back to the Srinivasan family <clears throat> because uh, as somebody meeting them for the first time, uh, it's particularly impressive to me how dedicated they are to neuroscience. And it is said in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, that to whom much is given, much is expected. And the famous anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never believe that a few caring people can change the world, for indeed that's all who ever have. And I, I choose these two quotes because, to me, they represent the impact that the Srinivasan family has had. And from what I can gather, and had a, had a chance to speak last night with them, they've exceeded all expectations, and in so doing have improved the health and well-being of people in this country, throughout the country. And I, for one, want to praise and laud them for their vision and generosity and humanism. Now, <clears throat> in preparing for today's talk, uh, I first had to look up in the dictionary what the word oration meant, because this is the first oration I've ever given. And thankfully, with the internet, it's not difficult to find definitions. And uh, there were two definitions given. One is a formal speech especially given on a ceremonial occasion, and I suppose that's fitting today. And the other is a speech delivered in a high-flown or pompous manner, 
which really isn't my style, as my friends know. So, uh, but what I want to focus on is the origin of the word oration from Middle English oration, which means prayer. And what I hope to do after I make my presentation is to come back to you and make a prayer uh, on behalf of people with epilepsy here in India. <clears throat> so the first uh, thing I want to talk about is just what epilepsy is. Epilepsy is a variety of conditions, a variety of brain disorders, which have in common one thing, and that is that they cause seizures intermittently. Now what is a seizure? A seizure is nothing more than an electrical disruption occurring in the brain, which depending on where in the brain it is occurring will result in a variety of different alterations in behavior or awareness or consciousness. You know the brain is like essentially like an electrical battery. It requires very tightly controlled flow of chemicals across the nerve cells to maintain its electrical functioning in a normal way. And when for unclear reasons that flow of chemicals across the nerve membranes is disrupted, the consequence can be a sudden surge in electricity, which we think of as a short circuit. And that short circuit temporarily disrupts the function of part of the brain, much as a short circuit would disrupt a certain electrical circuit in one's house or in one's car or motorbike. That's why we sometimes refer to seizures as brainstorms, figuratively speaking, because it is an electrical storm affecting the brain that comes and goes. Now as you can imagine, since the brain is a very complicated organ and subserves a number of different functions, that the uh, nature of the impairment of behavior caused by a seizure will depend on exactly what part of the brain is affected by the seizure. And consequently, from one person to the next who has epilepsy, the nature of the seizures may be very different, yet they both have epilepsy. The range of alterations in behavior can be as minimal or as mild and inapparent as a funny feeling the person experiences, a strange internal sensation that only they are aware of. But to somebody else there'd be absolutely no indication something is wrong. Or it can be at the other extreme a convulsion or what we call a tonic-clonic seizure. And for centuries it was the convulsion that was best known as a type of seizure because it is of course the most visually dramatic form of the condition. If the seizure occurs in the part of the brain that is important for memory, then it's likely it will affect awareness or concentration or consciousness. And so the person may look awake, but in fact is not aware of their environment or conscious. And seizures, because they can take so many different forms, are often mistaken as other conditions. For example, daydreaming, particularly in the case of a child who's having what we call absence seizures. They may appear to come in and out of attention as if they're daydreaming or misbehaving. Parents often think early on that their child might be misbehaving if they have changes in behavior that are otherwise unexplainable. Or it may be mistaken as a form of mental illness, which is one of the reasons over the, why over the centuries epilepsy has been misunderstood and stigmatized. Or if it occurs in an older individual, it may be, mis be mistaken as a heart attack. Or as somebody in the throes of dying. And it's not unusual for a parent, the first time they witness their child having a convulsion, to be concerned and afraid that their child is dying. Now if epilepsy means recurrent seizures and seizures are a symptom of some brain disorder, the next question is what can cause epilepsy and epilepsy has a number of different possible causes. 
anything that can damage the brain can potentially cause a seizure, particularly if it affects certain parts of the brain. But even with the most modern laboratory and neuroimaging tests, up to half the cases of epilepsy um, are unexplained. There is no apparent cause that we can find for that individual seizure, and that's a major unmet need today, is that we are lacking for an explanation as to the cause of epilepsy in so many people. Epilepsy is the most common serious neurological disorder in the world, affecting somewhere between 0.5 and 1 or 2 percent of the population, depending on the region of the world. It can begin at any age. When many of us trained, we were taught that epilepsy was a condition that began in childhood and clearly does begin in childhood for many people. But it can also begin in adolescence, in young adults, in older people, and in seniors. In fact, as the population ages in many, as the overall population ages in many countries around the world, epilepsy is beginning to occur more and more in people over the age of 60 or 65. So much so that uh, it is more likely that a person with epilepsy in, in my clinic will be over the age of 65 than a child. In other words, more people will be developing epilepsy in later years than in childhood. And that's simply a reflection of the changing demographics of uh, people in the world. Once epilepsy is suspected, based on seizures, then typically uh, a series of tests are undertaken to look for the cause, to confirm or substantiate the diagnosis with test results, and so the two most common tests that are used uh, would be either a CAT scan or an MRI scan, looking for abnormalities in the brain structure, and an electroencephalogram, or an EEG, which records the electrical activity of the brain, like a voltmeter would, would be used to investigate an electrical circuit. And there are very characteristic abnormalities in the EEG that can support the diagnosis of epilepsy particularly during a seizure. But again, many people who are diagnosed with epilepsy may have perfectly normal CAT scans or MRI scans or EEGs. Now, when a person with epilepsy goes to see the doctor, there's very little that the doctor can see in that person to make the diagnosis. It's nearly entirely a matter of communication, verbal communication, between the person or their family members and the physician, because it's usually the case that the seizure occurred sometime in the past, leading to the initial evaluation. What this means is that the accuracy and comprehensiveness of the information discussed with the physician is extremely important in making the diagnosis. <clears throat> and communication is a two-way process, requiring a careful listener, and an empathetic physician who is willing to spend the time with the patient and their family uh, to try to understand exactly what happened. They're often dealing with people who are very frightened about what took place and may have no previous medical training to describe what took place in medical terms and frankly may have not paid enough attention during the seizure because they were so concerned for the well-being of their family member so that they're not completely able to communicate the details perhaps to the level that the physician would like. And one thing we, we stress with our trainees and young doctors is the importance of communication both during that initial visit and from that point forward. It's, it's critical. Now I want to show you a few examples of people having seizures. <clears throat> These are a series of videotapes that were produced by the International League Against Epilepsy and the patients were quite willing to have their seizures seen in, in settings like this. And the main reason I'm showing these videos to you is to point out the, the differences in behavior that can occur uh, from one person to the next who has epilepsy. In all these uh, circumstances, to the left of the screen you'll see a scrolling uh, set of squiggling lines, that's the EEG, or brain waves. 
being recorded using electrodes that are put onto the scalp. And right about now, this gentleman is starting to feel um, the seizure coming on. And if you were a casual observer, you may not fully realize that there was anything amiss, but he's, he's very well aware of the sensations of having the seizure. And <clears throat> the purpose of him having this EEG is to document that the seizure, uh, that, that in fact his changes in behavior are seizures. As you can imagine, events like this would, would uh, not necessarily um, be thought of as epilepsy to a family member or even to the individual. And for that reason, it's likely that our estimates of the prevalence of epilepsy are low, that there may be other people experiencing seizures on a recurring basis, subtle perhaps as this, that don't recognize it as a medical condition and therefore don't seek uh, medical attention. Here's another example. This is a young boy. And in this particular case, the seizure is extremely brief. It's happening now. He's aware of his environment during this period of time. He can tell you later what took place. And then the seizure ends, and it's just that brief. So, of course, if the uh, uh, family member missed it, they, it would be as if it didn't occur. What's fortunate, though, is that he is aware when he has a seizure, and what he's getting ready to do now is record on a piece of paper that he had just had a seizure. <clears throat> this is a more dramatic form of epilepsy. This is a a seizure that begins on one side of this gentleman's body and then spreads to become a tonic-clonic seizure, or which we, is another way of saying convulsion. And he has some feeling that a seizure is about to occur. That's why he took his glasses off. So he has a warning, what we sometimes call an aura, which is fortunate for those patients who have that because they can take measures to protect their safety if possible. <clears throat> you see the, the seizure beginning on his left arm and he's conscious at this point but soon will lose consciousness as the seizure spreads throughout his brain, spreads throughout the networks of, of brain cells causing the tonic-clonic convulsion. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, the most visually dramatic form of epilepsy which has been recognized for centuries and accounts for most of the stigmatization and misunderstanding of epilepsy. Now at this point, his, uh, the people here are helping him down uh, and there are very specific safety maneuvers that can help reduce the likelihood of injury to somebody at this point. There are other things that have been uh, talked about or passed along such as putting a spoon in the mouth which are actually counterproductive and are not to be done. And as this seizure continues, this is now the tonic-clonic phase of the seizure, it will eventually end. And you see on the EEG the um, manifestations of the seizure electrically, bursts of electrical discharges that get progressively um, uh, shorter in duration, then the seizure itself ends, which begins a period of time we call the postictal state, or the after effects of the seizure. And the after effects of a seizure can last minutes to even hours, or in the case of a 60 or 70 or 80 year old, can last perhaps even days. And I'll explain some of the symptoms that can occur during the postictal state uh, shortly. And I'll show you one other example, and this example points out how unusual or uh, bizarre a, a seizure can look and, and this gentleman is now having a seizure. And if this is the way that a seizure affects a person, it's not uh, unexpected that somebody else may think this is uh, a form of mental illness or a psychiatric condition and it's not unusual for somebody to 
be referred initially to see a psychiatrist only to be found to have epilepsy. And it's just a matter of where in the brain the seizure occurs to result in, in behavior that we saw. So you can see how different from one person to the next epilepsy can be. And that is a source of confusion uh, to the public as well as to clinicians not trained in epilepsy. Uh, but uh, it's perfectly understandable given the complexity of the brain and the impact that these short circuits can have depending on where in the brain the seizure occurs. Now patients experience seizures though um, in their own way as well. It's, they don't experience it the same way we see it. And this is what patients will tell us in the office. And those who are aware of their seizures often have symptoms that are extremely unpleasant or foreign and these occur in a stereotype way during their seizures and influence how they feel about their epilepsy <coughs> and the understanding that they come to uh, about their condition. This particular patient, as you can see, describes her seizures as electrical firings that affect her visions, which flourish, and she hallucinates indescribable visions. And then she feels virtual slivers slicing her throat <coughs> as she draws the air in to describe them. And then she feels physically moved, sucked down into the explosion, fumbling through the chaos, landing disembodied from the intensity. For her, this is the reality of her seizure. She's a very gifted artist, and this is how she draws the experience of herself having a seizure. Her head disconnected from the body, we call that an out-of-body experience. You can see the, the heat in her body. <coughs> so this is, we, we can't possibly see this happening to her as observers, but to her this is what she experiences when she has a seizure. No wonder that she lives in fear of having a seizure. It's an extremely unpleasant experience. I mentioned that a seizure has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then it's followed by the postictal period, the after effects, which because of the duration, often lasting <coughs> me, much longer than the seizure itself, can be more disruptive to life than the seizure. And there are a number of symptoms that commonly occur during the postictal period as well. First and foremost, fatigue or the need to sleep and it's quite remarkable how after a two or three minute seizure a person may need to sleep for minutes to hours. There's confusion as if waking up from an operation, change in perception, <clears throat> headache or other bodily pains, particularly with a convulsion that may have resulted in injury, and a variety of changes in mood such as embarrassment uh, or depression even suicidality. And it's uh, worth, worth pointing out that we have no specific treatment for the postictal period other than trying to control the seizure itself. And yet this, for many patients with epilepsy, is the most disruptive part of the condition. <coughs> Here's how another person with epilepsy described their postictal period. She says that after a seizure she gets an overwhelming sense that everything she knows intellectually to be present is actually distant in time and space, like the sort of sense associated with the recollection of an old memory, or deja vu. With that, she has a powerful sense of anguish, pain, and loneliness. She doesn't remember the seizure, but she remembers how she feels after the seizure, and this is how she draws it. And can you imagine experiencing this sense of being of floating in, in space until your mind returns back to normal of being disembodied uh, and mutilated in this way. It's quite remarkable and again no wonder that she lives in fear of having seizures because she will experience this when she has a seizure and there's no way that she can talk herself out of it or uh, avoid it. It is an it is a obligatory <coughs> part of having a seizure for her. After a seizure, a person might feel ugly and they feel that they look ugly to other people, as shown here. By the way, I, I should mention that I collect the art of people with epilepsy 
and most of the art I'm showing has been drawn by somebody with epilepsy. <coughs> this is a German artist who has epilepsy, again showing how she feels, she, she believes that she looks like, a, like an ape after a seizure. And for her that is actually the way she want to look, that she wants to look after a seizure, which is quite sad. And the reason for that is because one time during the postictal period when she was helpless and not in full control of her faculty, she was raped. And so she hopes that to others, particularly would-be perpetrators, that she appears ugly and undesirable after a seizure. I've had patients who have been robbed if they've had a seizure out on the street carrying a package, Christmas package, for example. Um, I'm sure my colleagues have had similar stories as well. So that gives you a sense of what seizures may look like to other people and also what seizures may feel like to those with the condition. Well, the good news is that the outlook for complete control or suppression of seizures is quite good for approximately two out of three patients with epilepsy. With the uh, emergence of a number of new medications over the past uh, 10 and 15 years, this figure has increased somewhat. However, the problem is that despite having complete control of their seizures, about half of this group of patients will be experiencing side effects from their medications on a daily basis. Med side effects such as fatigue, trouble concentrating, uh, decreased short-term memory, double vision, or trouble with balance. <clears throat> you know, for our medications to stop seizures, they need to get into the brain. And the medications circulate throughout the brain and can have side effects on other normal neurological functions. One in three patients approximately with epilepsy who have access to medication and can take it on a continuing basis, unfortunately cannot gain full control of their seizures. And while their seizures may be reduced in frequency or severity, they nonetheless still occur. But for those patients who have limited or no access to seizure medications, nearly all are at risk for ongoing or continuing seizures. And we call that the treatment gap. Epilepsy, by virtue of the fact that seizures, as you saw, can impair a person's ability to protect themselves can result in injury ranging from broken bones such as the spine or the skull, uh, fractured teeth, burns if a seizure occurs while somebody is near an open flame or a stove. In some sections of Africa epilepsy is known as burns disease because they cook with open fires and horrifically because epilepsy is thought to be due to evil spirits in some villages, if a person has a seizure, they'll be left to, to burn to death in the fire. I had a patient who had a seizure and fell in front of an oncoming train, lost a leg. We've all seen patients in our office who wear the battle scars of their epilepsy because of the injuries that they sustained. So protecting the safety of somebody at risk of having seizures is a major unmet medical need at the present time. Epilepsy, in fact, can be fatal. There are patients who die, uh, and we uh, believe that it's related to their epilepsy. Some of these patients commit suicide from the severe depression associated in many patients with epilepsy. Others have an accidental death, such as drowning, a bicycle accident where they may veer in front of an oncoming car. I had a patient, a young man who was about to graduate from high school, who en route to a party had a seizure in the back seat of the car. His friends laid him, back, uh, laid him on the back seat face up. He vomited, which is not infrequent. And the vomit uh, went into his throat, and he asphyxiated or uh, choked to death. There's another form of death which is referred to as SUDEP, Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, which occurs approximately in the range of 1 in 300 to 1 in 1,000 patient years, meaning that if we follow a group of 300 patients over the course of the year, one person may die from this. Typically, the death occurs during the night, and we have really no uh, 
complete understanding as to why this occurs. <clears throat> and we've all lost patience to suit up. Here again, it's, an, it's a, of course, the ultimate in uh, complications of epilepsy in our ability to uh, identify which particular people are at greatest risk is poor. Many parents who learn about this wind up sleeping with their child uh, because they're so afraid that the child will have a seizure during the night. I mentioned that our treatments often cause side effects and patients need to uh, unfortunately balance seizure control versus side effects. We've all had patients who've said they'd rather have a seizure once a month than be impaired day in and day out to the point where they can't function because of side effects. <clears throat> epilepsy affects the family, uh, particularly parents in the case of a child with epilepsy or spouses or siblings. And uh, the impact on the family uh, is, goes in both directions. The family can influence the person with epilepsy as well. And we wind up uh, not only treating our patients with epilepsy, but counseling the family, which is a, a very important part of the process. Epilepsy is misunderstood by the public, uh, and I'll get into some of those reasons in just a moment. Here's a, a drawing done by actually an Indian uh, person with epilepsy <clears throat> trying to express in her way what it's like to have double vision and to be unable to focus visually throughout the course of the day. And typically this will come on within a couple hours of taking medication and persist for a while. And can you imagine having to put up with this day in and day out in order to uh, avoid having seizures? Epilepsy is a chronic condition and as we've seen many people with epilepsy continue to have seizures or side effects from medication. And like any other chronic illness, some people with epilepsy turn to other forms of therapy to try to get relief, such as herbal therapy in this case. <clears throat> in the United States, these are called dietary supplements. This happens to be a herbal formula in traditional Chinese medicine for stroke. Or throughout the world, people may turn to alternative healthcare practitioners, in this case, a shaman. This is uh, a photo from a paper that's in press um, <clears throat> by a group of uh, epileptologists. This is a, uh, a picture taken of a patient in uh, Shandigarh, I might be mispronouncing that, here in India. Uh, and the, this patient sought out the help of this shaman because uh, his seizures were not well controlled. Now, theories about the causation of epilepsy go back thousands of years. It's human nature, as we were saying earlier during a press conference, when we can't explain something and when we're afraid of what we're seeing, that we tend to try to rationalize or under, put it in terms that we can understand. And over the centuries, the most common explanation for uh, why seizures occur is the influence of supernatural powers, particularly evil spirits. And consequently, religious, le religious leaders over the centuries have been called on to treat people with epilepsy. <clears throat> and there's a famous uh, story about a boy with epilepsy in the New Testament. And in that story, a father brings his son uh, into the presence of Jesus to be cured of his epilepsy. And the story is repeated several times in the New Testament. And it's quite a remarkable story to read. But at the, uh, as Jesus is talking to the uh, father, the child then has a seizure in the story and lays motionless after the seizure's over, as you saw the gentleman who, who was helped to the floor was motionless after the seizure. And back then it was taken to mean that the person had died when our explanation today might be it was a postictal post state. But at that point, Jesus, who uh, in, the, in the time uh, uh, believed that seizures were caused by evil spirits that literally seized the individual, uh, treated the patient, or treated the boy, if you will, by casting out the evil spirits. And that is depicted here in this 
painting called Transfiguration, which is painted by Rubens, a Flemish painter from the early 1600s. And you can see the, the boy here in the midst of a seizure, his parents here. And <clears throat> I show this picture um, at this time because it very accurately depicts the uh, fear uh, that's going through the minds of the parents during the seizure. And these are quotes from parents I, I worked with who described what they were feeling when, the first, when they witnessed their child having a seizure for the first time. His breathing was irregular. He was turning blue. He looked to me like he was dying. Another parent said, I literally felt as if my son's life was slipping through my hands and I was helpless to stop the process. And over 400 years ago, Rubens or his apprentice, who, whoever painted this part of the painting, knew, must have known parents of, of a child with epilepsy because you can, you can see on their faces how horrified they are. And many parents, having witnessed a child have a first convulsion, develop almost a post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and are terrified of their child having further seizures. And that can have a number of consequences including overprotecting the child, which in the long run can be counterproductive. Now, the, the painting is also very perceptive in the way it depicts the people in the environment who are witnessing the seizure. <clears throat> when you talk to people who, who have witnessed a, a seizure, particularly a tonic-clonic seizure, if they're being honest with you, the first thing they'll say is they had the urge to run away, to flee, to get away. It wouldn't necessarily be the socially, the uh, politically correct thing to do, but it, it brings, if you're not familiar with this, the first time you see it, it's very frightening, and there's no way around that. And many people feel like running away and getting away from the situation. Can you imagine being a person with epilepsy, knowing that if you have one of these events, people around you want to get away from you as fast as possible? And you can see that here in the body language of the person seeing the seizure. He wants to put distance between himself and the child. So extremely perceptive uh, painting of this biblical scene. <clears throat> now moving away, moving on from the medical aspects of epilepsy, the seizures, the side effects of medication, epilepsy is also a a, a condition with psychosocial consequences. And I mention this because that becomes uh, part of the disabling aspect of having the condition. So people with epilepsy often feel alone or isolated. They may not know anyone else with epilepsy at all. And they may not know people who can really truly understand what they're going through, particularly if they're aware of part or all of their seizure. Many people with epilepsy suffer from low self-esteem, uh, depression, anxiety, and the depression or anxiety often uh, has a greater impact on their life because it, it occurs on a daily basis than do the intermittent seizures. And it's only the infrequent neurologist, though, who understands that and works with the patient uh, to identify and treat the mood disorder that may go with it. Depression is under-recognized and under-treated in people with epilepsy. This is a painting of a woman in, in the U.S. who suffers from depression associated with her epilepsy. There are a number of scientific theories about why depression occurs in as many perhaps as 30 or 40 percent of our patients, but uh, the, the fact is that it does, and it often reaches a a level that requires therapy unto itself. The sense of isolation or being alone is, is one that is commonly held by patients, <clears throat> particularly if they develop epilepsy in childhood before they've established a social network. This is a very bleak, um, personless, if you will, uh, depiction of the day in the life of a person with epilepsy from sunrise in the foreground to uh, moonrise in the, in the, at, the, at the horizon. The cracks in the bridge represent the gaps of time uh, that um, 
uh, are the uh, consequence of the person's seizures. And for him, this is his existence day in and day out, devoid of people. For some people with epilepsy, the only warmth they experience from other, other people is in the doctor's office, where they finally encounter people who understand them, who, who have some sense of what they go through. And we see patients who are, are doing well from the standpoint of their seizures, and we say, well, I don't need to see you every couple months anymore. Let, let's make it a year. And they, they complain, why, I, why, shouldn't, why can't I? I want to see you in two months from now. And the reason is because that we may be the only friendly, empathetic, understanding people that they encounter uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So for some people, uh, they just simply don't want to leave the house and they become homebound. It may be that only in their bedroom do they feel, you know, like, like a person. Part of the reason for that is that epilepsy is highly stigmatized. It's one of the most stigmatized medical conditions. <clears throat> and stigma can be in the mind of the person, we call that perceived stigma, or it can be actual stigma as uh, uh, as occurs in uh, discrimination or in a person being denied some uh, benefit. <clears throat> but it's imp I think it's really important to understand that a person with epilepsy may believe others have a certain attitude towards them when they may or may not. If they don't, we call that perceived stigma. And perceived stigma can be just as disabling as enacted or actual stigma. The diagnosis of epilepsy brings certain legal restrictions. Uh, Professor Krishnamurthy mentioned driving earlier. Uh, often a driver's license is lost for a period of time. There may be decreased opportunities uh, for activities that we take for granted, such as um, education, employment, socialization, marriage, starting a family. And as a result of any or all of these psychosocial consequences, epilepsy often prevents a person from living up to their full potential, from succeeding in life uh, in a way that they are capable of or making a significant contribution to society. Here's a very interesting and uh, sad picture. Uh, the artist here is German, and he's flat on his back, just waking up from a seizure. And what he sees is people looking down at him, both literally, they're looking down at him on the ground, but also figuratively looking down at him, meaning in a denigrating way. People with epilepsy who perceive this feel that sometimes they're below the level of, they're in a different level of society. And they may come to believe that everyone they meet on the street views them in that way. And that would be an example of perceived stigma, which is exactly what this person, a photographer with epilepsy, is describing in this photograph. Here he sets up the scene to show a clown, uh, which uh, is in the middle of this busy railroad station. <clears throat> and the statement he's making is that he, as the person with epilepsy, believes he looks like a clown to everyone around him, meaning that he looks like a, a total a different person in society. But the reality, which this photographer recognizes, is that no one is paying attention to him, that he uh, is being uh, viewed just like anybody else in that railroad station. So that in the minds of these other people, he, he looks like a normal person. But because, the, in this case, the person with epilepsy believes he is a clown or an object of ridicule in society, he tends to engage less in society, and that perceived stigma is a disability, and one that is very difficult for us to help a patient get past. Now, in previous decades and centuries, people with epilepsy were dealt with by removing them to a special place, a colony, 
for example, an epileptic colony, much like people with leprosy, would be removed from society. <clears throat> the last such colony in the United States closed in the 1950s, but these were throughout Europe and throughout the world. This is a, uh, a drawing <clears throat> that appeared in a uh, Parisian uh, magazine in the early 1800s showing people at an epileptic colony and it depicted the, these people as comical uh, figures in a very denigrating way which was politically correct at the time. Stigma or discrimination is perhaps not as overt as it was in the past but still occurs. And people with epilepsy can also feel marginalized or dehumanized by medical tests and by physicians. Not that we intend to do that, but if the person with epilepsy thinks that they're nothing more than an MRI scan or an EEG or a, uh, AE, a, a seizure drug level to the clinician, they feel less a person. This is the um, artist from India who uh, is showing this and what she felt like when she had an EEG test um, that she felt uh, this really uh, was dehumanizing. And here's a patient who uh, exp expressed this sentiment by creating what appears to be an MRI scan with his hands across it saying, no, I'm, I'm not just a brain, I'm a, I'm a whole person. These are reminders to us that um, what is before, who is before us as a person, as a, is, is somebody, a member of a family, and not simply a uh, test result or a person with a blood level. Now, that is what epilepsy is. What is epilepsy not? Epilepsy not is not a curse. It's not witchcraft. It's not the realization of a sin in a previous generation. It's not equivalent to mental illness. It's not something to be feared or rejected or avoided. It's not contagious. And it is also not a supernatural gift or a blessing, which is culturally the view in some parts of the world, such as among the Hmong people, H-M-O-N-G, which is a group who originated in Laos and Cambodia, for whom a person with epilepsy has one foot in this world and one foot in the world to come, and is viewed as having a gift, a supernatural gift. There are many people today who do not agree with this slide, for whom epilepsy is a curse, is witchcraft, is a mental illness, or is contagious. I'm ashamed to say that in the United States, a survey of adolescents done a few years ago revealed that half of the adolescents believed that epilepsy was contagious, that you can catch epilepsy by simply watching a seizure. Now it used to be that physicians believed that as well. I have a textbook from the mid-1800s by Sutherland which says that you can contract epilepsy by watching a seizure and the treatment was of course to remove the person with epilepsy out of sight to one of those epileptic colonies. But we have an obligation to educate the public that epilepsy is not these things. It's a brain disorder. This notion that epilepsy is due to evil spirits, again, dates back centuries. <clears throat> and here is another depiction of that scene from the New Testament in which Christ is casting out the evil spirit. And in this particular version, you can see a cloud leaving the child's mouth, that's the evil spirit leaving the uh, child. I should mention that the very interesting part of the story after that is that Christ recommends a couple ongoing therapies to the father, one of which is prayer and I think we need to understand more about the potential benefits of prayer and the other recommendation was fasting and fasting is, is usually the first step in the special diet that we often utilize for children with very frequent seizures because it alters body chemistry in a way that may be beneficial for seizures. 
So I'd now like to transition from what epilepsy is, both medically as well as psychosocially, what it's not, to a discussion of why epilepsy can be disabling. And to do that, I'd like to share with you a few quotes from patients with epilepsy here in India that I collected and have in a book called Brainstorms. It's a book of stories uh, from people, in this case, with epilepsy from around the world. And most of these stories reflect, in the person's own words, some of the issues we've already talked about. For example, the first patient, age 48, says she started having seizures when she was 17. In her language, it's called Mergi, Mergi. And in the Marwari community, it is regarded as a curse of God. She wrote this not more than five years ago or so. And her family members consider it a curse from God. The next person, age 29, was nine years old when she had her first seizure. A family friend assisted her over the years and eventually, uh, when she reached um, marriageable age, proposed to her, proposed marriage to her. Her parents agreed, but his mother objected, the, the groom's mother objected because of the woman's epilepsy, saying it was too risky to marry an unknown who may have a dangerous illness. And I've learned so much over the past few days about the extent to which epilepsy can be a serious issue with regard to marriage, um, consequences of disclosing the condition or not, dis not disclosing it, hiding it, taking seizure medications as vitamins um, because of the age-old, uh, mis again, misunderstanding about epilepsy and uh, the, the fact that it can be, up until eight years ago here in India, automatic grounds for a divorce that was only changed by an amendment to the Marriage Act in 1999. <clears throat> the next patient, age 35, said when she had her first seizure, her mother thought it was because her teacher had scolded her. When she had another seizure, it was the mother believing it was because she had refused to give an apple to a beggar, and she had seizures all the time. In this case, the mother attributes the child's seizures to uh, things that she does on a daily basis, rather than a brain condition that requires treatment and should be dealt with by the physician. The next patient <clears throat> lives in Punjab, where the illness is called a Dora, considered to be due to supernatural powers, and nobody understands what she goes through. <clears throat> the last two stories uh, here, uh, age 26, neither relatives nor family friends have assisted in arranging marriage. She actually met a, a young man that she wants to marry, and her family members are against disclosing the epilepsy to the young man. And her physician similarly told her not to disclose until she has her first issue, her child. But she recognizes this is a gamble. I was talking to Professor Krishnamurthy Srinivas earlier about how he counsels young women and families uh, so that this is all out in the open and it's understood and can be dealt with uh, productively. And the last patient, age 38, says she stopped attending all social gatherings for one year after developing epilepsy and cried all the time. She's not able to do her own shopping. She's afraid to travel alone. And it has affected the quality of her life. So you can, you can, we, we can see, learn from people living with epilepsy how it can be disabling, how it can adversely impact the quality of life. And so as we then focus on the disabling aspects of epilepsy, we can see that it, epilepsy can be disabling for a number of reasons, including seizures, side effects of medication, mood disorders such as depression or anxiety, sexual dysfunction, which can be both physical from the epilepsy as well as a, a side effect from the medication or because of depression, dependency on other people, lack of independence, worrying about the next seizure, which comes up time and time again in surveys of people with epilepsy is the worst thing about having epilepsy is the unpredictability of that next seizure. And there's absolutely no way for many people with epilepsy to know when they're going to have a seizure and they live therefore in constant fear. 
anxiety of the parents about that next seizure or will they die, will my child die from a seizure or die during the night and the stigma. So disabling epilepsy then is when a person is unable to live up to their full potential because of any medical or psychosocial aspect of having epilepsy. It's not just about having seizures, it's not just about side effects, but it's about any, any life-changing consequence of having epilepsy in the broadest sense. Which brings us to the final topic, and that is, how then can we meet the challenges of disabling epilepsy? And here on the slide, I, I present to you the stakeholders in this process, the groups of people who are in the best position working collectively to meet the challenge of disabling epilepsy. Physicians, the media, who are represented here today, government, foundations and philanthropists who play a major role in educating the public, educating physicians, and who support research and advocate for reforms, role models, people who are willing to publicly disclose their epilepsy and stand before others and serve as role models to encourage their peers to speak up and speak out about their epilepsy, as we've seen with other patients in other conditions such as AIDS or uh, even depression or cancer, and of course researchers who hold out the best hope for meeting the unmet medical needs we've talked about. The goal in meeting the challenges of disabling epilepsy is to replace disability with abilities and to move from being disabled to enabled. How can physicians do this? Well, physicians need to approach the care of patients with epilepsy from a, a different perspective than perhaps they were trained. When we were trained, we were taught to focus on the seizures, the side effects, perhaps the serum concentrations of medications. But as we've seen, that is necessary but not sufficient. There's more to it than just that. And this is a quote from William Lennox, a famous Boston-based neurologist, child neurologist, <clears throat> who made this point over 50 years ago and saying that as physicians we need to match modern drug and surgical therapy with practical socio-psychological therapy to be concerned not only with the turbulent brain waves on the EEG but with disturbed emotions. He was saying at that time what we are discussing this afternoon. The media plays an extremely important role in this process. And by media, I'm referring to print media, TV, movies, books. Typically, epilepsy is portrayed in a very negative way, especially in movies or in TV shows. The most dramatic, unusual, perhaps, form of epilepsy is often shown for dramatic purposes. Likewise, the words that are used in newspaper stories can unfortunately perpetuate the misunderstanding or the myths about epilepsy. And it's, it's the media that reaches the most people at, at the, uh, for the most, over the longest period of time, and is therefore in the best position to be part of the educational process and to portray epilepsy accurately and realistically to emphasize the abilities of people with epilepsy, not just their disabilities, and to distinguish between the person with epilepsy and their disorder, to refer to a person who has epilepsy as a person with epilepsy rather than as an epileptic, which is a way of distinguishing, differentiating the individual from their condition. To refer to somebody as an epileptic throughout their entire life conveys the impression that they and their epilepsy are one and the same. Likewise, to refer to their seizures perhaps as not being controllable or not being controlled by medication, but not to refer to the person as uncontrolled. How often we'll read a story about the uncontrolled epileptic. It's not that the person is uncontrolled, it's that their seizure is uncontrolled. For the person with epilepsy, the notion of control is one of the most central 
themes in their lives because by nature they can't control their seizures, but they tend to control, they tend to want to be able to control many other aspects of their life. And to be referred to time and time again as uncontrolled is, is uh, very difficult for them. The government has a key role as well by uh, enacting through law measures to protect their, and preserve the rights of people with epilepsy, not to restrict or deny access to important uh, activities for people with epilepsy. And I, I applaud um, Dr. Krishnamurthy for leading a group here uh, to um, propose to the state government of Tamil Nadu uh, ways in which they can protect the rights of people with epilepsy to ensure access to uh, educational opportunities, to employment, uh, transportation assistance, assistance with medication, to help them get on a footing to be able to move forward with their lives. We learned yesterday about laws in Germany that do this. Uh, we've, we've made attempts to do this in the U.S. as well. And I look forward to uh, learning about the success of the efforts here uh, in this state as well as other states in India. Government also has a role to promote public health programs to eradicate some of the common causes of epilepsy, such as head injury. I understand that the helmet laws here in India or in this state vary from uh, period to period. Head injury is a very common cause of epilepsy and of course the extent of brain damage can be mitigated by wearing a helmet common everyday measures that can lessen the likelihood of developing epilepsy. I believe the government has a role in promoting uh, education in these areas uh, to prevent epilepsy from occurring in the first place. Foundations and philanthropists can and do play a major role in supporting uh, public education, education of physicians, support groups for people with epilepsy, web-based education, web-based ways of interacting with other people. The Indian Epilepsy Society and the Indian Epilepsy Association are very active in this area. I'm affiliated with a website called epilepsy.com where over 200,000 people a month come to our website and many of them chat with one another to share experiences <clears throat> and to develop a sense of community so that that sense of isolation is lessened. Philanthropists also have a key role in supporting research, particularly at an early stage, at a time when it may be viewed as too high risk to other grant-giving organizations or industry. And I want to show you a short video of a philanthropist from the U.S. who took on this challenge, <clears throat> started a, a group called the Epilepsy Therapy Project, which has given out over $5 million in research uh, support, particularly for early stage research. He has a daughter with epilepsy, as you'll see. My name is Warren Lambert. I founded the Epilepsy Therapy Project together with other parents of young children with severe epilepsy and with leading clinicians and research scientists. My 10-year-old daughter, Sylvie, lives with daily seizures, and she is far from alone. Of the 3 million people in the United States and 50 million worldwide who have epilepsy, approximately one-third live with active seizures despite all available therapies. Another third achieve control with medications that have unacceptable side effects. I helped start the Epilepsy Therapy Project to raise money for new, more effective treatments. We provide both direct economic support and direction from our scientific and business advisory boards to turn promising research into new therapies for patients. We seek out those therapies which we believe will have the greatest impact on patients' lives in a time frame that is relevant to people living with epilepsy today. Developing new therapies, however, takes a great deal of money, and epilepsy is badly underfunded. That's why we need your help 
Even a small donation can make a difference to those who, like Sylvie, need help to bring their seizures under control. Please join and support the Epilepsy Therapy Project. Thank you. Role models can be extremely important, but often difficult to come by. Because epilepsy is so stigmatized, many people who are in the public view are unwilling to share their epilepsy with the world. And we know many celebrities who have epilepsy, <clears throat> but are unwilling to make it public. And role models can be particularly uh, uh, powerful in getting people with epilepsy to uh, uh, comply with medical therapy, to get on with their lives. This is a young woman who's the goaltender for the women's Olympic hockey team who came out and publicly acknowledged her epilepsy and has been very influential among young people in the United States. And finally, to meet the challenges of disabling epilepsy, we need to make advances through research to understand and resolve every aspect of disabling epilepsy, whether it's seizures, <clears throat> side effects of medication, the mood disorders, social disabilities we've spoken about, <clears throat> ways to avoid injury or dying as a consequence of having epilepsy, and stigma. Each of these areas requires an intense effort to better understand and through research and then programs to actively address and resolve these areas. Now I'd like to conclude with what I intend to be an upbeat message to our friends here in Chennai and from throughout India. <clears throat> and that is that I, I'm convinced, having been here now my second time, that India is in a unique position to meet the challenges of disabling epilepsy. For one thing, India is blessed with brilliant physicians, healthcare professionals, wonderful medical centers, scientists and engineers, technologists, advanced technologies, world-class pharmaceutical and biotech companies, passionate advocates, as we've met these past couple days, committed people with epilepsy and their families, generous philanthropists, and at the same time, India is challenged by a huge number of people with epilepsy. Perhaps one in five people with epilepsy around the world live here in India. And it's estimated that over 500,000 new cases of epilepsy occur in this country. <clears throat> and there is a huge treatment gap, a huge number of people who do not have access to or cannot afford medications on a continual basis and consequently suffer seizures for lack of uh, availability of medication. In fact, when I calculated the number of people in this country that do not have regular access to seizure medications, it's three times the total number of people in the U.S. who have epilepsy, which is astounding. And India is also challenged by stigma, which is entrenched for centuries. But I think India is in a position now, the stakeholders, um, if they come together in a creative alliance, bringing science together with technology, business interests, philanthropy, and government, I believe that there are the components in place if put together to demonstrate to the world how to effectively close the diagnosis and treatment gaps and to eliminate disabling epilepsy. What will success look like if that happens? Somebody who is unable to function because of seizures or side effects may become a famous writer one day, such as the list shown here. These are all people thought to have epilepsy. <clears throat> Writers, world leaders, artists, musicians, actors. Somebody in a village who's having seizures for lack of access to medication could be the next brilliant musician. 
Well, I want to conclude by coming back to my definition of oration. I hope my speech wasn't too formal, and I certainly hope it wasn't high-flown or pompous, but I do want to take this opportunity to offer a prayer <clears throat> to, to you today. And my prayer for India is that there not be a single Indian who has a single seizure for lack of access to treatments or because of inability to pay. That all people in India with epilepsy live up to their full potential, enabled to derive fullest meaning from life, and that India shows the world how to close and eliminate the diagnosis and treatment gaps. If that happens, what will success look like? Will he have, have people saying, I have epilepsy, but now epilepsy doesn't have me? How can I thank you for giving me, giving me back my life? Thank you very much. There is a tradition in this oration that there will be a short question and answer session. And uh, I would like those of you who are asking questions to announce where you come from and make the question brief. I request Professor E.S. Krishnamurti to join me on the stage as a, one of the moderators. And all the distinguished people who have come for this workshop, we might call upon them for their comment, but make it very short. The definition of an oration, Professor Schachter, in Clifford Hawkins' book is that Dr. Winken B. Nord laid a sheaf of papers on the lectern and read on monotonously, occasionally looking up to see if the audience was still there. Thank you. Sir, I think, uh, please come up to the microphone. Uh, I'm Dr. Amis Bwami, a retired professor of anatomy, ancient person. And I thank you, Dr. Shaster, for the wonderful oration. I think I, I learned it quite a lot. But there was something that perhaps was missing was, what advice would one give to a person, to a specialist, uh, especially regarding marriage and then uh, genetic predisposition to epilepsy? That was the only thing. Thank you. Yes. So, we recognize that in some individuals there is a hereditary or genetic cause to their epilepsy, <clears throat> but we think this applies to a relatively small percent of the population at the present time, perhaps 5%, at most 10% of people with epilepsy. Of course, if there are other people in a person's family who have epilepsy, then they may be more likely to have a genetic cause. Some of the, the biggest breakthroughs in the last number of years have been to identify the genes responsible for these gen genetic forms of epilepsy and then to understand in what way the genetic abnormality affects brain function in a, such that seizures are a consequence because it's believed <clears throat> that if those mechanisms can be understood that the, uh, the therapy will be much clearer, in other words, the the way in which medications uh, are chosen to act on those mechanisms would be quite rational, knowing what the actual abnormality of function is. But uh, many of our patients who come uh, uh, for our advice about marriage or about conceiving, have, starting a family, are concerned about this, and we take a careful family history, and in the majority of cases it appears not likely that epilepsy is genetic and consequently uh, can reassure the family. Sir? In Srinivasan, I uh, represent a company called Meda Mind Enhancement. Uh, basically, the chairman of the company is Dr. Barry Sturman, whom you might have heard of. Uh, we've done some work with epileptic patients here in Chennai. And we have about six people who we, we are working with and have found uh, tremendous changes using neurotherapy or neurofeedback, uh, which was not mentioned uh, in any of these things. I just want to get your views on that. Yeah, thank you. So there are a variety of non-pharmacological treatments for epilepsy. 
that have been written about or have been investigated, <clears throat> and it's quite a long list, including neurofeedback, which trains a person to uh, be able to control their brain rhythms in a way that is felt to be anti-seizure. There are other approaches to this as well, um, and we encourage research in all of these areas to better understand how effective they are, which patients are most likely to benefit from them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, techniques that reduce a person's stress level can be quite helpful because stress is a very frequent uh, cause or um, trigger for a person's seizures. And techniques such as yoga, meditation, uh, a variety of mind-body techniques can be helpful in reducing stress levels. Uh, botanicals are an, an area of interest of mine personally. Uh, it's a non-pharmacological uh, uh, therapy. So we, we encourage all of these uh, approaches, particularly those that can be affordable and can be accessible uh, and that are safe. Uh, because uh, for so many people with epilepsy, um, this is an issue. Thank you. I'm Dr. Kamala, pediatric neurologist. I would like to comment that the triggering factors in childhood epilepsy is also an important factor in prevention of recurrence. Nowadays, the children are so much addicted to TV viewing and uh, video games and so on. And uh, num late nights is also a practice in some families where they have the dinner quite late and go to bed late and the children keep uh, uh, jumping about or playing for a very long time. So whenever we co counsel them, parents as well as the children, the lessening of TV watching and late nights have improved the uh, have improved the lessening of the recurrence in epilepsy and this is an important aspect of counseling among parents and children. This is very peculiar to children where they, they are fascinated by the video games, computer games and so on. Their study hours are much less and I recently read in the paper that the cell uh, itself can accommodate a full novel in it and children in Japan, there was an article saying that the teenagers and the young children are so much addicted to this habit. So much so the perversion from the study hours and the habits, the regular healthy habits have been sort of forgotten. And this also triggers the balance in the brain. Thank you for your comments. We, we want to point out to our patients and families the day-to-day -day lifestyle considerations that we, we think will benefit them. On the other hand, we don't want them to lead such a regimented life that they're precluded from growing up and becoming, you know, and being children and maturing into adults. So it's a, it's a fine balance. And some parents are overprotective and others are underprotective. And it, for a child neurologist, I know that this can be difficult, but uh, thank you for, for that comment. It, the, there are some people with epilepsy who um, can have seizures when watching a monitor or a TV screen. <clears throat> and there was an incident in Japan where many children are very close to the TV set of a cartoon called Pokemon, and there was a flashing uh, light, uh, alternating red and white light, I think it was, and a number of children had seizures and were taken to local hospitals. So it's, it's our responsibility to point out some of these lifestyle issues and moderation, um, but to do so in a way that parents don't overreact and obsessively shelter their child from growing up in a normal way. Sir? Dr. Ventabri, a professor head of the Department of Pharmacology. I want to have a doubt how frequently childhood migraine and epilepsy, I mean, or epilepsy, the beginnings of epilepsy in the childhood, how frequent they are and how can they be differentiated? Because I'm concerned because I have a son who has migraine, but I feel 
he may be having an epileptic like thing. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, migraine headaches are um, occur more often in people with epilepsy than people without epilepsy. And a seizure can cause a headache, a migraineous like headache, as part of the aftermath of the seizure. And rarely a migraine headache can trigger a seizure. So there are a number of different uh, ways that epilepsy and migraine headaches can interrelate. Um, and, uh, but we need to approach each situation individually to try to tease out to what extent there could be you know, one or another uh, of these conditions in any particular individual. Um, interestingly, some of our seizure medications also have anti-migraine properties as well. So this uh, migraine headaches may reflect some disturbance of intermittent disturbance of brain function uh, that can also occur in epilepsy, but perhaps by a different mechanism. Maybe not the electrical disruption mechanism, but vascular, perhaps. But uh, uh, for some patients who do not remember their seizure, they only remember the headache that comes after it. And they may conclude that they have bad headaches. And um, some people with migraine headaches have an impairment of consciousness as well. So it can be difficult to um, completely uh, distinguish the two conditions without taking a, you know, time to explore in depth as to the particular circumstances. We'll have two more questions. One is the gentleman who has come from, we are multiracial. We have three races and uh, culturally and religiously, I find that the Indian race in Malaysia tends to have uh, ability to go into a trance easily during religious festivals and uh, during these moments of going to a trance they go into strong involuntary movements. Now have you ever, is there, has there ever been a study done between what happens in a trance and, and what happens to an epileptic patient? Uh, is there something like that that's had, uh, that's, that has been recorded? Not that I'm aware of, but uh, I do know that uh, uh, I'm told that some masters of meditation. The question part. Just one minute, sir. Just, just one second. You answer that. Uh, just to try and answer that question about the trance, because uh, the, the trance is something that uh, happens during religious functions and festivities in this part of the world and it's almost encouraged to happen. In fact, if you look at certain religious festivals, there are people who are brought there who have the ability to go into a trance. And personality-wise, these are people who are suggestible. Uh, the difficulty is that you can have trance-like experiences as part of epilepsy, we know that, and you can have trance-like ep experiences without having, ha having the epilepsy kind of activity in your brain also. And the, in this part of the world, uh, this is an important differential diagnosis because we think about what we call non-epileptic seizures, which are events that look like epilepsy, but they are not really epilepsy. Another reason why a, a person with trance may have uh, uh, jerks is that they tend to hyperventilate, panic, and then they go into a, a mild attack of syncope. They, they faint. And after they faint, they'll have two or three jerks. So when you ask someone, did the person faint? They'll say yes. Did he jerk? They'll say yes. And you then think it's probably a seizure that they had. And of course, this illustrates the fundamental difficulty in epilepsy diagnosis because you're relying on witness stories to make your diagnosis. You seldom have somebody have an event right in front of you. Uh, Kamakshi, you wanted to ask something. Why a fit stops at all? And what goes wrong in status epilepticus? Excellent questions that I can't answer, but it's quite uh, remarkable that <clears throat> a seizure can stop on its own and, and does, you know, 99% of the time, uh, if not closer to 100%. And 
what is the reason for that occurring is probably lost or deficient in those circumstances where the seizure doesn't stop and that's what is referred to as status epilepticus. It, it would seem intuitive that if we understood uh, the mechanisms by which a seizure stopped that we could come up with therapies that reinforce that mechanism or reproduce that mechanism. Final question, Professor Zaheer. No, I didn't have a question. I wanted to answer this doubt. Oh, right, okay. Uh, there's a mustang. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I was very, I'm quite audible even without a mic itself. Uh, but that is besides the point. Now, there was a question, somebody asked that a person in a trance can be differentiated from a person from a seizure, very much so. This, uh, uh, the neuroscientists in this place have, uh, with the IIT, have uh, done a project in which people who meditate for a long period of time, they have monitored these people and they have, they have applied all the past spectrum analysis to the EEGs. I mean, that EEG is totally different from the patient, from the EEG of a patient who has a seizure. And the same thing I would say for Dr. Krishnamurti's uh, uh, problem of hyperventilation. One look at the EEG and you know that it is one, what is a trance and one is a seizure. But I would caution uh, that what shows up on the surface, what shows up on an EEG from electrodes on the scalp may not pick up seizure activity from deep within the brain, and we've all seen examples of that in patients with epilepsy, so, uh, but I, I appreciate the answer.